Hi, and welcome to my talk, Deep Dive into Building Streaming Applications with Apache Pulsar. I'm Tim Spann. I'm a developer advocate at Stream Native, and I'm pushing all things open source. Hopefully you like it. I wish I was there in person, hopefully next year. So I've been working with different open source and streaming technologies for over 15 years. Things like NiFi, Spark, Spring, Big Data, Hadoop, Data Lakes, IoT, all those fun things. I run a weekly newsletter called the Flipstack Weekly. Check it out. Great way to find out what's going on with Flink, Pulsar, NiFi, Spark, Delta Lake, all kinds of other open source technologies, access to demos, code, webinars, videos, articles, cool tools I've seen out there, great use cases, some cool pictures from events and pictures of my cat. So come out, take a look. We're going to be talking today about Apache Pulsar. Uh, this sums it up in one sentence. There's a lot packed into it. Cloud native. We designed from the beginning to run in the cloud, which means we like to separate compute and storage. We do both messaging and event streaming. I'll show you how we accomplish that with one platform. Any cloud, every cloud, every day. So we have one platform to do all your messaging you'll ever have to do. Guarantee that your message will get delivered. Very resilient system. Make sure you keep running even when servers go down, even when things are not available. We got you covered. And scale out as large as you need to go. This has been proven in uh, a couple of the large cloud companies in India and China to go out to petabytes, thousands of node, thousands of millions of uh, messages, events a second, as big as you need to go. Why use Pulsar? Very easy to build microservices, real-time apps. Uh, asynchronous communication is a uh, bare minimum. Highly resilient system, built-in tiered storage, does whatever you need to do there. Under the cover, the architecture is not too complex but it's separated into three different types of servers. We've got Pulsar brokers to handle the message routing and connections. Stateless with a little cache, make things quicker. Automatically load balances. This is what you're gonna be communicating with as a developer. Uh, behind the scenes, all the messages get stored in Apache Bookkeeper bookie nodes. These handle how messages are stored and retrieved. Both uh, the Pulsar brokers and the bookkeeper bookies use uh, a metadata storage layer to do their metadata and service discovery. This can be traditional Apache Zookeeper or especially for the Kubernetes people, etcd. And on the small scale, you do with RocksDB. This API is open, so we expect more will be there. And this just handles storing any metadata you need. And there's a lot of it in a big system, as you might imagine. The main thing that we handle in Pulsar is messages. That's what we call any of the data. And it's broken up into a couple of key components. You got the most important one for you is the value, your data payload. This is raw bytes. But since we have a schema system, it can conform to a schema so we can ensure that, hey, it's JSON, it has these fields, they're not nullable, all those sort of things. We really want you to have a key. It's optional but makes your world a lot easier. And I'll show you how easy it is to set it. We use this for partitioning, topic compaction, help you try to identify messages when you're doing uh, debugging or logging or auditing. Very, please put a key in there. Properties, any other things you want to add to your message. It's not in the main body of message, goes along with it. Key value uh, pairs of data, put a couple of them, makes sense for you, helpful for logging or auditing or another way to hide some extra data in there if you need to. Set a name for a producer. We'll set a really bad one for you if you don't. Please put a name there. Helpful for auditing, used in message duplication. Set it, just like a key, important to have. Sequence, make sure you're in an order inside the topic. Again, for streaming, that's important. And this is helpful for when we have to do deduplication. So that you don't have to touch. It'll be done for you. We mentioned messaging and streaming. They are really similar, but not the same. And message queuing, 
and we use these usually for word cues, you don't have to be in an order because you just want things to take a message and run it. Whoever gets the next one, great. This is great. You want to scale out getting data done. It doesn't matter when it arrives. I just want to get it processed as quick as possible. Put things in a dumb pipe, comes out the other end. People are running with it. Message queue. We do that with Pulsar. Streaming. This is a lot of use cases you've seen with data lakes, Hadoop, and other systems. I want things in order because it came out in order. Maybe it came from a log, came from a time series database, came from IoT, came from CDC, from tables. I want it in a controlled manner, in order. I usually want things, you know, at least once, exactly once. All those semantics are handled for you. You make a couple of decisions there. Now, if that's all we did, messaging and streaming, that's a lot. But you need to be able to connect to the system and do lots of other things. So one of the important things out there is using connectors. Now, this makes your job easier so you don't have to write code to do everything. Maybe you like doing that. I certainly sometimes do, but sometimes it's nice just to sit a little configuration file and have it work for you. Do the fun stuff, not the boring stuff of picking up one message, dropping it into a table. But the connectors do that for you. There's connectors for reading things like Debezium, MySQL, Cassandra, Kafka, you know, Data Lakes, S3, Hadoop, all those kind of fun things. Get the data from them using simple configuration file in YAML or JSON, puts it into a Pulsar topic for you in a proper format, remember those schemas, and then use it however you want, easy as can be. Now we got the same thing for coming out. So, you know, once something gets into a Pulsar topic, maybe you want it always to go to Mongo, always to go to ScyllaDB, always go to a Delta Lake, always go to S3, always go to Kafka, wherever it is, Set it up, little config file runs for you automatically, just keeps going. Nice feature. Related, but not the same, we support functions. These are lightweight bits of code in Java, Python, or Go. Either runs on the Pulsar broker or in your own uh, Kubernetes cluster. We have a function mesh to uh, empower that. This is not to replace Spark or Flink or our buddies at Time Plus or Decodable. This is just for doing little bits of stuff. Convert one type to another type. Change a couple of fields, do an enrichment, do a lookup. Take a big blob of JSON, break it up into smaller bits of JSON and send it to different topics. Make decisions on data to do routing, that sort of stuff. Maybe run sentiment analysis, run an existing uh, machine learning uh, library you have, do that. Great fun, very useful, kind of like database triggers. Pulsar protocol handlers, these are awesome. This is what sets Pulsar apart from anything else. We mentioned you got all these sources and sinks, that's great. But what if all of my people want to use Kafka and I want to run Pulsar? Well, let's, let's do both. I'll run a Pulsar cluster, turn on a protocol handler to allow Kafka. So now all those existing Kafka libraries, including KSQL DB and KStreams, uh, Ricardo tested this live, pretty impressive. I'll send you that link. You could just use this as a Kafka broker. That's great. Now I have a Kafka cluster and a Pulsar cluster, only running one piece of infrastructure. Uh, someone else wants MQTT, turn that on. Someone wants Rabbit AMQP, turn that on. Someone wants Rocket, turn it on. What's nice is, I don't care how that data is coming into Pulsar or how it's going out. I can mix and match. Someone sends, uh, pushes a message into me in Kafka. I pull it out with Pulsar. MQTT in, AMQP out. Doesn't matter. Or all of them at once. I could have someone subscribe to the data via any of these protocols. Plus WebSockets. Very nice. Now, I mentioned our uh, functions are not Spark. So we support uh, a very robust Spark connector, robust Flink connector, and a robust Presto Trino connector. All of these allow you to write code against Pulsar and also SQL. So this gives you a real-time SQL engine on any of these. 
so I could access an event or a message as it arrives. Pretty powerful stuff. And in case you tell me, well, Tim, I want to put petabytes of data in there, but I don't really want to run petabytes of SSD. That's a lot of money. Okay, well, let's, once we get to a certain age of data or size of data or some random other thing you think of, let's tier it out into object stores like S3, where it doesn't cost that much to store hundreds of terabytes, thousands of petabytes. Let's do that. It's transparent to you. I still get the data the same way. I still sync it the same way. I still send it, produce it, consume it, read it from Spark. It doesn't matter. It just saves you money. Now, sometimes that data is raw bytes. Sometimes it's not. Very often it's not. I mean, maybe 95% of my use cases are this data looks like a table. You know, maybe it came out of a table. Maybe it's going back into a table. Maybe it's coming pretty structured, semi-structured. Maybe it's JSON. Maybe it's Avro. Maybe it's coming to Parquet. Maybe it's a CSV. Well, with schemas, I can make sure that data stays consistent so it can have a contract between all my producers of data and all my consumers of data, whether that's Spark SQL, Flink SQL, your own app. It's in uh, C Sharp, it's in Go, it's in Python, it's in Kotlin, it's in Rust, it's in Node.js, doesn't matter. Let's agree what this data is, what the field names are, what the types are, what type of data it is. Let's build a schema, version it automatically for you. I don't have to know how to write schemas. If I know how to write schemas, great, just upload it to the system, you're good. If you don't wanna do that, create a class in Python or Java, put the names you want, put the types you want, describe if it's uh, nullable, send it to the system. Boom, now I've got a schema. Most people do Avro or JSON. You could also do Protobuf and some others. Again, everything in Pulsar is open source and extensible. Want to add some more, do it. So we mentioned those different protocols, Kafka is one. The thing I want to point out is this is not a paid add-on. This is not some half written proxy. It's not some kind of hack. It's not doing double the work. This is a native handler, the same as the one that's used for everything Pulsar does, except we have one for Kafka as well. She could run both, use all those Kafka libraries out there. And it's just another way to get your data into and out of Pulsar. Doesn't change how it works. Underneath the covers, I could still get all the features of Pulsar, get the data in and out the same way, still have tenants and namespaces and full security and all the libraries and all the sources and syncs. Just makes your life easier. If you've got existing apps, see you've got an existing device like one of these that only can push out MQTT, you could still use Pulsar. I turn this on, it looks like a Pulse uh, MQTT broker to the outside libraries, boom, it goes in, we're ready to go. No uh, no difference for you. Same for if it's Rabbit or AMQP, and we've got one for Rocket, extensible, write your own. Now, if you want to get data out and you don't want to have to write a little client or use the command line, you're like, I just want to see what's in my topic right now. Presto Trino, very fast, great SQL tool. There's uh, web UIs and there's GUIs you can install to connect to it. JDBC, ODBC, great, uh, Python connectors, great way to query data. Well, great way to query data that's stored in Pulsar, whether that's in those bookkeeper nodes or it's running in that uh, tiered storage, doesn't matter. Get all that data out, run full SQL really fast. Great way to see your data now whatever the current state is. You run your query, it completes, there it is. I say this because that is different from what I do with things like Flink and potentially Spark, depending on what type of SQL I want to do. Now in the example app I'll show you, I've got data coming from a device, going natively into Pulsar, could have done MQTT, could have done WebSockets, I've got examples for those two, could have done Kafka, you come up with a protocol, we'll do that too. Uh, when it comes into Pulsar, I've got uh, Function does a little management. I also have a sync, drops it right to Delta Lake, and I could use that data in Delta Lake, query that from Spark, or I could have Spark point right into Pulsar, 
couple of options there. We've got those sinks in there. I'm doing the Delta Lake one. There's one for Hootie, one for Iceberg. Lots of lake house options out there. Support them all. Very straightforward to get your data into these impressive lake house structures. Not a lot of uh, extra work there. Pulsar does a lot for you. Built-in geo-replication. And I want to emphasize this is all open source. This is not commercial. All these features are there. All these connectors are there. Everything's Apache license. You use it the way you'd expect to use it, and it just runs. And it doesn't matter different sources and syncs you might be connecting to. doesn't matter what cloud you're running this stuff on. I can have a cluster in AWS in an, in an availability zone, another in Google or Microsoft or on-premise. Great way to get your data from on-prem to the cloud, maybe in different amounts, maybe converted and cleaned with functions, routed to special topics that just get geo-replicated. Very easy to configure these things. Great way to buffer data before it goes somewhere, batch it up into chunks if you need to, route it wherever it needs to go, filter out some of the junk or dupes, aggregate it up and just send an aggregate to somebody, enrich the data along the way, replicate it between clusters, different parts of the world, get rid of those dupes, decouple your different systems, distribute it to as many uh, places that want to get the data. People subscribe to the data, they get it. You can have as many as you want. And a subscriber could be something like Spark. It could be Elasticsearch. It could be your own Python app, a Rust app, a C-sharp app, a Node.js app, a Kotlin app, a Scala app, a Java app, Spring app, Quarkus app, tons of options. Now, we mentioned those functions before, and maybe I downplayed the importance. It is a full serverless event streaming framework. Kind of like AWS Lambda, but all open source and you run it either in your brokers or in a function mesh open source uh, Kubernetes environments. Uses Pulsar as the message bus to just connect all these pipelines and very easy to run it. What's nice is you got your options of Java, Python, or Go. You can run ML uh, libraries or whatever libraries you want. Specify one or more input topics to come in, could be a wild card inside your function. You could uh, have stuff log out to a topic, or you could have it go to one or more output or no output if you're just doing some kind of processing. Maybe it goes into the context buffer. Maybe it goes into a file system or some other data store. Really easy to write these functions. If you want to run along with me, save these slides. They'll, they're in the uh, in the website. Download those, follow these along. I've got all the details on how you can run Pulsar, and try out different use cases here, learn the basics. Download one if you want to do it on-premise. Untar it. Type bin Pulsar standalone. You're ready to go. You'll need a JDK. Other than that, you're fine to run. Runs on Mac, Windows, all the Linuxes, whatever. If you don't want to worry about that infrastructure stuff, just run it in Docker or another Kubernetes-like environment or something that runs containers. There's some other tools out there that do it just as well. Pretty easy to do that. Once you've got something running or say you're using, uh, say, Stream Native Cloud or someone else's uh, Pulsar hosted environment, uh, easiest way to interact with it is the command line interface. Certainly use REST. You can certainly use different web UIs. But this is a great way to learn how to use it interactively or set this up in a DevOps tool. We create a tenant, create a namespace, and create a topics underneath there. Now, the important thing I mentioned there is tenants. Pulsar is multi-tenant. That's why we could be the unified messaging for everything. So you could get rid of your Kafka, MQTT, and every other rabbit, every other messaging system you have, put it all under Pulsar, create tenants for all the different apps, turn on all those different protocols, have namespaces for different apps, groups, companies, whatever. Everything's secured under each one based on what security you want to set up. At the end, create your few hundred thousand topics under each namespace and you're ready to go. Now, the naming of this is not, is not uh, transparent until you look at it very carefully. That first word, persistent, is not a generic keyword or something that's not important. 
persistent means I'm going to store these messages perhaps forever. Now, if you don't want that, you could use non-persistent, which is the case where, say, I've got a very loud device, keep saying the same thing constantly every, every fraction of a second. Maybe I don't need the data. I just need to sample it or pick messages at random. Don't matter if I lose them. Choose non-persistent. Most people use persistent. Stored forever if you need to. Then I set up my comp as tenant. Europe is namespace. First is the name of my topic. It's the, all the topics in that same area. Very straightforward. Now, if I want to interact with stuff, send some data, consume some data, easiest thing to do is install the Python library. Make sure you're running Python 3.10 or better, I would hope. Uh, just do pip3 install Pulsar client. Uh, you could stop there if you just want the current one with the basic functions. If you want everything on the latest version, I've got that listed. This will install on Mac, Windows, uh, NVIDIA Jetson, Raspberry Pi, a bunch of different architectures, which Arch64, ARM, M2, Intel. That's probably all you need to do. If that doesn't work, maybe you're on some funky architecture, you can install and build the C++ edition and then install Python on top of it. That's a little extra work, but if you need to do it, you can. Very easy to send data with Python, import the Pulsar library, connect to a cluster, create a producer for that tenant namespace topic, send the data, here it's just string, and I'll just do UDF. Simplest use case, that works. That's really simple use case. Most people have security. Okay, I have SSL, Pulsar plus SSL. Put in the right port. Uh, same topic, namespace, whatever it is. And then apply my authentication parameters. In this case, I'm doing OAuth. And uh, it happens to be at the stream native uh, cloud. Could be anybody's cloud. There's other authentication options. This is a, a good one. Pretty easy to do with full security. Doesn't take much extra work. I turn this on and off in apps with a single uh, uh, parameter passing. Very easy. You want to add a schema? Okay, let's add Avro. Uh, schema is easy in Python. I just set the class and I put in uh, what I need there. And I'm going to do Avro. Avro around that class. I've got the name of the field, the type, and if it was required or not. This one's not. Wrap it with Avro schema, send it to a specific topic, and we're ready to go. And I send it with uh, that record and a partition key, and we're ready to go. And then if I want to do the same for JSON, very easy. I just have, uh, again, a class, connect, uh, wrap that with the JSON schema. Send it. Again, see that I put the producer name in there as a property. And I'm sending that key. Again, useful for partitioning, uh, debugging, uh, lots of lots of deduping, lots of reasons. Send the key. Now, if I want to get the data back, connect to that client. Now, if you're using OAuth, it's that same thing again. Now, the important thing you see here is that subscription. And I give it a name. That is my subscription. Now, people can share them, but if I'm the only one using this, the server will manage where it is, and I will never lose a message. And here, I receive the message. Until I say acknowledge, that message does not change in the system. Once I acknowledge it, it's acknowledged in the server, and then if I decide I want my data to expire and not be stored forever, it will be gone. Something to think about. You don't have to acknowledge it. You can negatively acknowledgement or just ignore it, but then it'll stay around, it'll potentially stay around forever. And that's how you get petabytes of data, which may be something you want, maybe not. Just remember that until I acknowledge it, sitting in that subscription for me. And it won't be deleted unless we have no choice. So we'll keep it there. Maybe you want to use another library. I could use native libraries for those protocols I mentioned. MQTT, easy. None of this says Pulsar other than I put the name of the server in there just so you know where we are. WebSockets, 
It's a little bit of special formatting to do web sockets. I've got a base 64 encode my message. Other than that, very easy to send it. This is just going to my Pulsar cluster, producing a message that's persistent. It's going to this tenant namespace and topic. Very straightforward. I could use the Kafka library to do that. Now, now that I've got my data in, let's create a topic. Uh, let's create a function and it's going against the topic. And I've got a Python uh, function to do that. It's going to log to a specific logs topic and put the results somewhere else. This is just going to run sentiment analysis on anything that comes into that topic and send the results to another topic. That makes it very easy for me to put that in a web page, call that with web sockets. Nice way to run a simple app with very simple coding. Very easy to write a function in Python, as you see here. If I use the full Pulsar SDK, I get access to a logger, get access to metadata, message IDs, all those sort of built-in things that are nice to have. Uh, if I want to do a Go app, Go supports connecting to Pulsar as well. This is an extremely fast library for Pulsar. So if you're a Go person, enjoy. Same with Rust. Those guys just fly when you're pushing data through Pulsar. Java is a first-class support. If you want to write your apps in Java, very easy to do so. You would also new, use the new Spring library or the Quarkus library. Lots of other options out there. If you're producing data in Java, you know, it's a little verbose. But we got the OAuth just like you do in Python if you need it. If you want to use a different library from Java, you can use all those ones, including the Spring one for Rabbit, uh, the Spring one for MQTT, Spring one for Kafka. Very easy to do. If you're making a very simple one in Java, create a uh, producer, send a message with a key and a value, send a couple properties, you're ready to go. Very simple. If you want to create a function in Java, you could do that just using the standard Java functions. Nothing Pulsar specific here. Pick an input, pick an output, give it a name, ready to go. If you want to take advantage of the full SDK and get access to a logger, get the ability to send to different topics, get to use the uh, built-in key value store, get access to metadata, uh, you're going to want to use that SDK and get that extra data there. Uh, when you want to subscribe, you can pick your subscription name, like I mentioned. I didn't mention subscription type, so we only got 40 minutes here. We could go deep into subscription types. This is how we decide if you're messaging or streaming. With a shared one, I'm messaging. I get the first message available, and so can 50 of my friends. And we process this data all together as a team, whoever grabs one does it, next one grabs it. That may not be what you want if you want in order or Kafka style streaming. So you'd pick a different subscription type. That's the only difference. Data comes in, however it comes in to be streaming, I change that to exclusive or a different subscription type. If I want to do messaging, set it to shared. Very easy. And again, with that subscription name, that's what ties you to the topic. And multiple people could use that same name. But, you know, if you're in shared, whoever gets it first, that's their message. Something to think about how you want to do that. Uh, very easy to produce events from Java. Again, use the schema. Point it to a Java class. I don't have to create a topic, a, a schema with, uh, you know, some kind of schema editor. I could just create a class with the field names I want and the types and ready to go. If you want to create it with uh, a formal Avro schema, perhaps you could do that, but this makes it easier. I could send timeouts. I could send things sync or async. Lots of options for working with things. Lots of access to metrics, whether you do it through the REST API or you look uh, exported to Grafana or other systems, or you look through JMX. Or you use the uh, command line tools, lots of different metrics on every part of the system. You can see what's fully going on. Everything's transparent. Big things about being open is we're open source and open for discovery of the data and the metadata. 
when I'm done, very easy to clean up if I want to. Delete my topics, delete my namespace, delete my tenant, shut down the Docker, we go home. Uh, you don't have to do that. Keep it running forever. Lots of use cases commonly used, having one message platform for everybody. Ad tech loves this. Real-time fraud detection works out really well. There's some big credit cards doing it. Connected car, you get a lot of different data coming from a lot of parts of the car. Works out great with Pulsar. Doing real-time analytics and IoT, again, a great use case. Microservices, really easy to connect them. Doesn't matter the language you're using. So it's a nice way to do microservices and still connect it with other systems, feed your data any way you want. Lots of different apps you can build here. I've got one for real-time air quality. Air quality comes in from a couple of different consumer producers of data. One a Spring Boot app, one Apache NiFi. Get it from different sources, get it into different topics. I've got a function, takes all that data, cleans it, normalizes it, then splits it out into the different types of air quality readings, whether that's PM25, PM10, or ozone levels. I push that into those topics and then a continuous Flink SQL app runs and looks at them, sends that into another topic or aggregates it. Spark takes uh, batches of that, drops it into some S3 files for other people to do analytics. I've got links to everything you might want to uh, try out, but let's look at a demo. We'll see if everything is timed out. Hopefully not. I've got a full rundown of the full demo here. You could try out all the sensor parts. You try out sent it, uh, setting up the Delta Lake sync, deploy it, run it, see the stats, look at the output as part cave files, look at it in a Delta Lake shell, whether you're doing a Scholar or a Python, uh, run a Spark app against it, then uh, create a Flink SQL app against it, create a Presto SQL against it, do a Spark structured streaming app against it, display it in a live dashboard using WebSockets and JSON. Let's see. So this is the topic I'm sending you to. There's a number of subscribers on there. And as you see, it'll tell me what they're doing there. Let's start up the data so we can start seeing some things coming through. Now, this is my IoT device on a Pi. And I just want to show you the, the code here. We've got a little thing to run it. It's a Python app. Connects to some sensors, connects to Pulsar. Here's that record. You can see it's got the names of the fields, the type, and if it's required. That's all I need to do to build a schema. Pretty easy. So I grab all my sensors and stuff, get some data, get some timestamps, build my ID. And then from there, I'm just going to populate a record, send it to uh, Pulsar. Pretty easy. So I'm just going to run that. It's going to warm up those sensors there. There's like four of them. Once they're up, it's going to start sending them to that Pulsar cluster. You can see it's formatting it as JSON. JSON data is coming into the system. We are live and a go. Let me show you. Uh, this is the Stream Native Cloud to show you that schema. And this translated that for me automatically. It named it based on the class. Put those fields in there. Put if it's nullable or not all that type of fun stuff. So that's in here. If I refresh this, this is the open source tool here. Oh, lost my connection. This one is available for everyone. Uh, the stream native one is only if you're using that particular cloud. So uh, this Pulsar manager just comes with everybody. And I can look at, again, all the tenants, all the namespaces under that tenant, and then find my topic. And uh, it was something sensor. Okay, it's this guy. And then I could see the throughput going on for the whole thing. I could see who's subscribed and who's got a backlog. And I could clear that out or unsubscribe people if it was junk. Like, uh, I don't know who this guy is. He's just wasting my time. So I could just unsubscribe that one if I wanted, you know, just to get rid of that if we need to. So we could see there, we could see there's a partition there. Uh, you have an I option to partition every topic. Underneath the covers, if you only have one partition, it still exists under there. You specify no partition. There's got to be one. Uh, partitioning is something to let you expand out how many consumers you may have. This is typical if you come from the Kafka world. You know what's going on there. 
Okay, so I have some data coming in from that system and I want to use it for an app. So I have a Delta Lake connection here in Spark. I connected this up, used the Delta Lake functions, connected to my object storage here that's getting dropped by the sink. And I can see the schema for all that data coming in. That's going to look familiar. It's the same fields. And then here I could just query those uh, that Delta Lake file, all those different files in that directory, which are a special parquet. And I'll just pick some fields, order it, and show just five. And this just gives me uh, a hundred, maximum space of 100 for the columns so these big fields fit. And I could just see that data coming in. That's recent data. And it's stored in my lake house. Now, if I want to do some real-time analytics, I've got Flink connected here to uh, Pulsar via the Pulsar catalog. Let me show you what this table looks like. This table is that topic. So that's why we have that schema. So I could do this automatically. So I'm just going to do a simple SQL query. Now, if I wanted this to get stored somewhere, I could do an insert into another topic or some other Flink uh, catalog uh, location. Easiest would be to just send it to another uh, topic. So I'm running that SQL that gets deployed as an application. I go to the Flink dashboard, I could see that it's got that already. And since I have live data flowing, it's gonna start displaying it. As a new event comes in about once a second, a new one shows up in my query, continuous query. This was an insert, new record would get there. Here's where I could do fraud analytics. I could put this, wrap this up into a Scala Java or Python Flink app and have this do real-time analytics on it. Now, if I want to do things like aggregates, I could do an aggregate as well. That old job got uh, cleaned up and the new one's deployed already. And you can see here, one's the source coming out of that topic, tenant namespace. And now I've got a group by on it. We're starting to get data there. Now there is a way I can get more data. I can specify in my table that I want the first record that ever came into the system. Because remember, I can keep it forever. I didn't do that. It's just doing them as they come in. So just what's there now, but I could go back in time if I need to. Now I also have running a WebSocket display of all this data. I'll just refresh my page. This is a simple HTML page with uh, some simple jQuery that's calling WebSockets to Pulsar to get the latest data from that topic. And as you can see, it's refreshing. I've got an eventual timeout on this because I'm not uh, the best HTML person, but it makes it easy for you. You just connect to that Pulsar topic over WebSockets and you get the data. If you wanted to send data the other way, you could do it. And I like this little library because I can sort things wherever I want. You just sort by the data that's coming in. Pretty straightforward. But I could do that with other data as well from Pulsar. Uh, let me send some data here. I've got uh, Apache NiFi connected, sending some uh, transit data. And I think over here, I might have some weather data. Let's send, is this weather? Nope, that's the same place. And I'll go do some weather data. It's nice to get uh, fresh weather data in. So I'll grab all the weather reports in the United States and I'll just send them to Pulsar. And we're sending a couple thousand there. They'll keep coming in. And then when I go to my screen here, I've got the transit data coming in from New York area a lot. <laughs> and I've got uh, all of my data coming in from the weather feeds. And that's live, again, via WebSockets. I can read in WebSockets. I could read that same data down here in Flink. Like if I wanted to... Uh, Say, look at uh, weather. Let's see, is that the right one? There's a couple weather topics. Is it weather or pie weather? Eh, we see. We'll look at the weather table. Yeah, let's probably try not to do that on the fly. Okay, that's a binary one. That's probably not the one I want. I probably want pie weather. I keep changing my mind when I call these tables. 
But yeah, you can just select what you want from one as long as they have a schema. If I forgot to set a schema, then it's not going to be there. Again, you don't need a schema for things like uh, JavaScript because you just parse the uh, JSON. If for some reason you don't want one of those, as you can see, there's a lot of a lot of that data coming in. More than that, those sensors. There's a lot of uh, weather data in the United States. Uh, we're running out of time. I want to show you. I could also do the thing with real time airline data. I could do that with weather data, transit data, sensors, logs, whatever source you might want to use very easily. These are linked here. If you have any questions, I'll be around the whole conference or email me or hit my Twitter up. I'm always looking to show people different ways to work with open source tools that I call the Flipstack, Flink, Pulsar, NiFi, Spark, all their friends. Thanks for coming. Hopefully you liked my talk and I'll see you next year in person.